se baie? Baie. Se baie? Baie. Baie. Law. I am not going to read this this bio to you. I'm not to send it out. Everybody should take a look at it. Uh, it does a couple things which are useful. First of all, read it with regard to um, your bio your bio in ten years. What's your bio do? Which is to say, I mean, this is a professional bio. This is what academics do. Lots of different things. Um, and you want to, if at all possible, make sure that you touch all these bases. She's touched a lot of bases. Um, and, and aside from being interesting and I hope fun uh, and useful to the body politic, the global body politic, it's, it's uh, the kinds of things that one, get your jobs, which is important, uh, but secondly, let you leave at the end of the day and say, you know, I contributed something. I contributed something. That's what this is about. Um, we don't get too many folks here, unfortunately, I'm trying to fix this, uh, who are, um, who do work in Latin America. Uh, so if you have, uh, as an area studies kind of a focus, if you have questions for her with regard to Colombia specifically and, and perhaps other places, I'm sure she's given some thought to other places in Latin America, uh, and how that impacts what's going on both there and here. Big future coming up for Latin America in the next 50 years. Big future. Okay. Uh, we tend to study Southeast Asia, China, tend to study Europe on occasion. Uh, and the Middle East is in the news all the time. Uh, but, uh, but Latin America and Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa are the places that, that you will be teaching about. Four years for sure. They're going to be in that place. Uh, guaranteed. Uh, if for no other reason, demographics, but for lots of other reasons. Uh, so there's plenty of things that you can ask her about with regard to development or anything else. We're really happy to have her and uh, to add value to, uh, to our, our colloquium experience. I guess you Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. <coughs> It's weird to have like more time than that day. I'm so used to like rushing through presentations. I'm like, oh, it's actually it's a little slower, so I you know, managed to try and slow down by very quickly. Um, but this is work out of uh, my dissertation, which is now you know I'm working on turning this into a book. Um, and so this is actually one of the first pieces that I wrote um, initially, um, and it came out of some vignettes. And again, these are things that we can talk about later in the Q and A in terms of the process of getting through, um, getting to where I am now. Which again, I've, ooh, oh, there's a mic. <laughs> um, I just finished. I finished my PhD last year uh, at Columbia, and so I'm so glad. Uh, and so here I am at, at Rutgers this year after a postdoc. Um, being abroad, I was actually in Ghana most of this year. So I'm thinking now moving our work. Um, always keeping sort of a connection to Latin America, thinking about the sort of African diaspora, um, including and so thinking about South Africa and Ghana right now, too. So we're uh, expanding. Okay. Um, so her name was Luisa. She, re she allowed me to enter her home to conduct an interview, and in speaking with her, the latest script when referring to the body became evident, making me wish that I had recorded interviews more during my first visit to the community two years prior because I'm certain that the conversations were quite different. When I used the word gentrification initially, um, in 2011 to express the process that appeared to be in its nascent stages, but quite obviously unfolding in the body of its in my knee, it was clear that no one had heard the word. And now the word gentrification is thrown around so much that people even play on it and call the change process that's happening in its in my knee, its in And so Louisa spoke a lot about tourism and used what I later would, la would later read about later realized are the three primary buzzwords associated with Hensi Money right now. Cultural, artistic, and historic. And I begin to ask myself, why were these marginalized native residents evoking the language of tourism and NGOs? Was this about respectability politics, that in order to gain the respect of those who shun them, they must redefine who they are and fit within the bounds of those deemed worthy um, of respect? Maybe it behooves the community to recreate their image to prevent displacement since their low racial and class positions and the social hierarchy make their community vulnerable to devaluation of land, 
and rapid, rapid neighborhood transformation. Yet by destigmatizing de themselves as a community and racial and ethnic group, are they making their neighborhoods sort of cool and safe and therefore um, more open to those uh, consuming it at, at will? Do the politics of respectability end up serving as contradictory tools that in fact further and accelerate displacement? So I follow multiple people who, who occupy qualitative, qualitatively different positions in the neighborhood of Hetsimani and Cartagena. And what this was, this was a, a relational ethnography that I did. Um, and in the big picture, in the big project, I asked, how do people negotiate who's worthy of occupying um, often contested space? So the following primary research questions guide the piece of the project. And again, this is a, bit, a sliver of the, of the larger piece um, that I'll discuss today. So how do marginalized actors make meaning of their devalued social positions and craft responses to such positions? And how are race, ethnicity, class, and gender encoded in the value of urban spaces and places? So theoretically, I draw upon the sociology evaluation and the work of urban, urban ethnographers and uh, race and ethnicity scholars. And so I'm still playing with these frameworks. Um, so there, because there are a lot of approaches that you can take to this kind of work. And so um, we can discuss them a little bit later if you wish to, but I always feel like this is a little bit more important. Um, but again, I'm still sort of thinking about how to frame this work broadly. And the book, the bar, the broader book project, project, hmm, broader book project. Public speaking is not my favorite. <laughs> um, and so my my overall contribution is to, uh, my overall objective is to connect a political and material focus on work with a study of the mechanisms through which culture enters into valuation processes and consequently consequently into an inequality. And so to that end, in this paper, I demonstrate how symbolic boundaries are used to combat downward social mobility at the neighborhood level. And that race and ethnicity are encoded in the value of urban spaces through symbolic boundaries, which structure racial, economic, and socio-spatial relationships. The project involves sustained fieldwork engagement for, oh, for 12 months for the course of three years. So I was there from 2011, I was at Cartagena from 2011 to 2014, on and off. And then in the last stip was a full nine months, um, so I was awarded a Fulbright, uh, full, uh, Fulbright Student Award, so Fulbright Columbia in the US to spend the last nine months there. Um, and so I conducted semi-structured interviews and open-ended interviews with residents of the neighborhood of Hetzamani, business owners from within and outside of the community, scholars and those in, in government and working with four NGOs. And so the interviews were conducted in two parts. So I first explored the patterns emerging from the repeated use of still photographs, a few of which can be seen here. Um, and then the second part of the, uh, of the resident interviews, I posed questions about personal history in the neighborhood, whom residents believe have inhabited over time, the neighborhood's history of crime, changes which have taken place, and how the residents believe that others perceive them and their community. And so let me give you a brief uh, sense of my research site. In, 2000, in 2011, Cartagena, which is uh, shown here on the map, had about 960,000 inhabitants, which makes it the fifth largest city in Colombia after Bogota, Medellin, Cali, Barranquilla, and the second most populous coastal Caribbean city. Etsemani, which is the locus of this investigation, is comprised of around 6,000 people, um, and it lies within the old city walls and just outside those of the historic downtown center of, of, uh, of Cartagena. And so what you see in sort of the orangey shaded area is what's considered the old city, um, and then Cartagena, there's Etsemani right there in the, in the bottom corner. And so originally a home for enslaved blacks and later liberated blacks, artists, and seamen, it has historically been considered an Adabal, a somewhat derogatory word that expresses its suburban, peripheral status to the historic center, as it has always been considered the popular body of the lower classes. In spite of the city's growing uh, reputation for tourism, during the 1970s, Hetzimani began to deteriorate significantly, both physically and economically. Following Cartagena's economic crisis and the city government's decision to transfer the main market, which is pictured down at the bottom right, um, so it was relatively it was within the neighborhood, and they moved it to a neighborhood called Barsulto. And so during the 1980s, the public and private partnerships, which urban scholars consider typical of contemporary urban development, intensified. And so the Fort, Fortress, and Group of Monuments of Cartagena, which includes the Hetzimani neighborhood, was deemed the UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1984. So in the last two decades, due to Hetzimani's location and classic Spanish architecture, it has become, uh, become valued real estate and a product of what Neil Smith calls the outward diffusion of gentrification from the urban center.
So those who own properties are being offered more than 10 times uh, what they would have been offered 10 years ago. There was a perceived reduction in crime, which was considered rampant until recently, and an increase in access to transportation. Um, and so here's some news articles, and these all, if you, if you notice, so I, I got there in 2011. So again, these conversations weren't being had. And then, then once it happened, it happened. So I just, so it worked out that I, I mean, I stumbled uh, upon the neighborhood, really. I was sort of hanging out, and I was like, you know, looking around. And um, I have a back, I've done a lot of uh, gentrification work in, in uh, Washington, D.C., in New York City. And so I saw all the flags. I was like, huh. You know, there were a lot of backpackers that seemed very comfortable being there. And then, some, but in addition to those backpackers, there were a lot of people who would have normally thought, you know, the more risk averse crowd that wouldn't have felt safe to go there a number of years ago. And so when I saw that, I was like, okay, this, this is changing. There's something happening. And so I started talking to the residents and saying, like, you all do, and this is literally what I told people, I was like, you do realize that in five years you won't be here. And this kind of got this, this ball rolling, this conversation. And then very quickly, you saw these sort of, again, so you have New York Times, you know, you got Forbes, Condé Nast, BBC. Um, and so what I did is I just sort of underlined here, just, you know, the sort of, again, some of you have heard this before. Right? This is very classic language when you're talking about gentrification um, in urban spaces. So you had, you know, like this, again, the idea that the, the neighborhood was basically nothing until this right revitalization that's being brought to life that it was dead before. So it, just, it emerges, great emerging spot, or the barrio. Uh, coolest, most invigorating and authentic, up and coming, talk of the town, um, draw locals and tourists, right? So this idea of playing on authenticity, playing on this idea of, you know, we want to kind of draw you in with this sort of the native local residents, but we also want to make it seem like it's hot and sexy and it's something that um, for, and again, think if you think about the sources, right? So this is coming, these are in spaces that are being, you know, in English, um, English uh, publications in the US, in the UK, and so, you know, the newest hot spots with 200-year-old buildings, boutique hotels and killer nightclubs, um, restaurant hotspot, up and coming. I mean, these are, this is literally the, the, some of the exact wording that you see in, in Brooklyn, that you see in, in other places around the world, and in, in Berlin, and all of these different places where you see this sort of very rapid transformation happening in urban spaces. And then again, it's always in contrast to the way it was. Like, look at this, this turnaround. So it was once dangerous, complicated past, formerly a haven of prostitution and drugs, um, once seedy neighborhood, uh, once a woebegone Columbia district characterized by crime, right? So this is that you see this sort of juxtaposition between the way that it once was and this idea of look at the comeback or look at this new thing that's being um, produced out of, uh, out of, you know, in this particular moment. And so, um, so there's also an increase in tax burden, noise, traffic, the cultural segregation of new and long-standing standing residents and the displacement of the latter. And so here in the bottom corner, um, and again, I took all of these photographs. Here's a pic um, from late October 2013. Um, and so this, I took this following the removal of about 10 families that had been living in this sort of like block of housing um, in this area for generations. And actually, uh, but primarily as what's considered squatters. And so uh, remembering his now valuable property, the owner has thrown all their possessions onto the street. And so the families were given some money, but to see so many members of, of Hetsimani disappear at once, shook the core of the community. And it spoke to the fears of the 70 plus percent of people who are not homeowners, um, that they too one day would have their belongings cast onto the street. And so in this paper, I provide examples of interactions, conflict, and, and the configuration of relationships at the regional, city, and intra-neighborhood levels. And so now I'm gonna provide just a few examples of the tensions between those at the regional level, specifically between Medellin uh, on the interior and Cartagena on the Atlantic coast. The keynotes with little things are off. Um, and so, okay, so in May I was in a taxi heading to the airport for Bogota. And this is when I was going to give my presentation to uh, the Fulbright uh, Commission and all of the fellows, the seven of us, were coming from around the country to meet and to present our work. And so the driver, while not from Cartagena, was from Valle de Bar, which is also on the Atlantic coast of Colombia. And he asked about my marital status and decided to take the opportunity to give me his thoughts on where I should find a suitable partner. So he said, the men from Medellin make the best husbands. They are the workers, like the Germans. And I jokingly told him that the paisas seem to have the best marketing and PR than anybody. Like, I mean, you just hear this all the time about the strong workers, they're just like the Germans. And again, um, again, thinking about the, the sort of comparison and what, what things are being compared to. So the paisa identity is synonymous with a number of physical and cultural characteristics. 
As a taxi driver express, people from Medellin or Paisas and Antioqueños, those are all the words that are used um, for the names for the people from, from this area, um, they're regarded as having a strong work ethic and are almost considered the foil to the lazy costeño, so the person, the lazy person from the Atlantic coast. And so the driver's association between the Paisa and Europeans was also no surprise, as Paisas are generally associated with whiteness. For example, in an interview with a 35-year-old woman from Medellin, who was a small business in Hetsemani, when asked about her race or ethnicity, she responded, white. I'm of the white race of Medellin, hardworking, very strong fighters. We are very nice and very friendly. And so this reference to the Antioqueño or Paisa race is also quite common. The strong Paisa regional ethnic identity is partially based upon a myth of racial purity, racial purity, and a lack of black and indigenous heritage. And so this was uh, written by a, 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 a major scholar uh, from the region. So again, there is little of any African contribution, in any case, never to be the extent supposed by some. So it's a constant minimization and sort of saying like, no, 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 we are pure white. We are not, uh, we've been sullied up by, you know, the, 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 the people who are descendants of uh, formerly enslaved Africans or the, the indigenous population in, in Colombia. And so there are a ridiculous number of historical contemporary examples of tropes about Afro-Colombians referring to their indolence, sensuality, and strength, and an, ability for an inability for analytical thought. For example, this one by another scholar. So by the year uh, 1630, the crucible of race dropped a new element, the black of Africa, that while without analytical capacity or, or, or an ability for abstraction, apart from their indolence and sensuality, brought us its physical strength to, the face, um, to face the rigor of these ardent climates, its sensitivity and its rich imagination. The cultural boundaries, oh, sorry, this is often uh, juxtaposed, well, again, with the, with the white Antioqueño. Pisces are, are, exemplar of human, are, Pisces are an exemplar of humanity. Hard work and quick movement, tenacity and adventure, arrogant and passionate, loyal and a lover of his land and his home, individ, individualistic and habitual, provocative and a dealer, entrepreneur, and persistent. And so well, the cultural boundaries between the Pisces and the Costeños also came up in a number of interviews. Um, from the perspective of Paul, a bar owner in the neighborhood, and a native of Bogota, and speaking about Hetzemani, it's a barrio of lazy locals, and they want to chat their days, hours away because they chat. They can chat. They can really talk about nothing, but they will talk all day long. They're not deep, but they debate about whatever, which I don't think happens in Bogota or Medellin. So here we're presented with the image of the lazy Cartagenero from the neighborhood who engages in endless, meaningless conversations in a way that is atypical of someone from Bogota or Medellin a way which many residents of Hetzemani actually describe as part of the body as openness and friendliness. So the impression that the Paisa identity is associated with whiteness and economic prowess is a strong and positive one, which has prevailed among many throughout Colombia. Even the drug traffickers in the Medellin drug cartel, headed by Pablo Escobar and the Antioquia, became the prominent focus of the media and public an example of Paisa entrepreneurship. However, in Hetzemani, the connection between those from Medellin and drugs and sex work is used as a strategy for constructing moral boundaries and destigmatizing those in their own neighborhoods, city, and coastal region. For example, when asked about the history of sex work in Hitsimani, Linda, a 52-year-old native resident and street vendor, shared, all that type of life has been present throughout the country, not just the neighborhood here in Hitsimani. Okay, you see prostitutes on Calle Media Luna, where they go into Centennial Park, but if you were to interview them and ask them where they're from, they will tell you they're not from here in Cartagena. They are from Monterrey, uh, from Medellin. That is to say there are no prostitutes from this neighborhood. Right? Because again, when you ask people often about, you know, ask people about this history of the neighborhood, and people particularly who are from outside, um, whether they are, they're European or they're from other areas within the country, will often talk about the sex workers and look, you know, look at this neighborhood. And this is, you know, again, to sort of um, cast a negative um, sort of light on the, on the neighborhood given the way that people perceive um, sex work. Um, and so a 54-year-old uh, male business owner and long-term resident shared the following with regard to prostitution. No, 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 there has never really been prostitution in the neighborhood. In other words, prostitutes from the neighborhood. But the people say there was a famous place and a man put around 300 women for sex work, but women that came from the interior, they weren't women from here. Women come to Cartagena because it has always had tourism. Brothels were outside, here on the periphery of Hetzemani, but there were not women of Hetzemani. 
They were women who came from Medellin, Bogotá, Cali, other cities of Colombia to prostitute themselves. But really, there has never been a brothel inside Nixon Mani, or that is to say, never, never neighborhood girls. Never. Um, and finally, Juan, a very local lifelong resident, shared, In Medellin, what is produced is pure shamelessness. The pure villain is born. Drug trafficking, contract killing, um, killings, everything bad that is, that's the Pisces. Medellin, Pereira, Manizales, Pisces are, are all, uh, as they are called in that region. Supposedly, they are whores. They are murderers, hookers, and hitmen, the most of them. And so Juan is quite, explicit, quite explicitly shifting the negative stigma associated with his neighborhood, city, and region to those who he, whom he is placing outside of what he, what he deems acceptable. Um, the other residents cited are also attempting to dispel the notions that sex workers are native to the barrio by locating their origins outside of the neighborhood. And so you would see this happen a lot also with when it came to drug dealing. Um, and so one of, for example, one of the questions that I ended up including in my um, and my interviews was based upon one of the, a business owner in the neighborhood um, made a comment to someone who was doing neighborhood work and said, oh, the only thing that Hexamani senses so people from the neighborhood are good for is uh, selling drugs and robbing people. And so what I ended up doing was I ended up taking that comment and saying, look, I heard somebody said this. What do you all think about this? And what I ended up saying, like, no, 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 no. That's not us. And so you always, you often had this sort of, um, this rejection of these, these sort of the negative stigma um, of the stigma in general, and then sort of, but often put on other people. So, for example, when I would talk to people about um, this idea that drugs, you know, this was a very, um, this a, a community that had a lot that dealt with a lot of major drug issues, they would often say, "Oh, well, that was from um, those are people who came from other neighborhoods," and that's what I do in the paper too. I talk about again at these different levels. So I talk about um, so the different regions within Colombia, but I talk about different areas on the coast. And so I compare Cartagena to Barranquilla. Barranquilla again is another is a coastal region, but is one that is perceived as of uh, as having of a um, basically being more white uh, than, than Colombia than Cartagena rather. And so I see I look at these sort of comparisons, and then what I also do is I look at within Cartagena itself. So I look at you know the sort of city region, uh, the city as a as an as an area, and compare people's perspectives um, on Hetsim, on the, the community of Hetsemani versus other neighborhoods. And then what I also do is I look within the neighborhood itself. And so looking within the neighborhood itself, I see, for example, people would talk about this one little block, particularly when I would bring up the idea of uh, you know what was going on in terms of, of drugs. People would say, oh no no no, that's just that that little block right there, and that's because they all came from outside. Again, it's all often placing what's going on outside, and part of it is again is, is in this moment of um, in this moment of tremendous change. What I find is that people are trying to say, like, look, we have value, we're worthy, we don't have all these negative things that are, are being said about us. They're not real. Um, it's not us. You know, we deserve to be here. And so that's a, a lot of what I'm exploring now. And so today I sought to provide you with a sliver of a study of how symbolic boundaries are invoked to both revalorize and stigmatize. So bridging uh, participant observation, photo elicitation interviews, and an analysis of existing literature, I was able to analyze interactions between residents occupying different positions within a space that I, love that. I, decided to, I was going to give you more and more examples, and I was like, oh, well, let me get to questions, because I know I end up not saving enough time for questions, and, and to sort of unpack it a little bit more. But I guess any thoughts or questions about, again, um, as we said, in terms of... <coughs> can, you, can you explain how the racial hierarchy and social class order interact with each other in Colombia? Oh, okay. So yeah, so again, like I, I um, this idea of, so what, what brought me to Colombia was actually looking at the Afro-Colombian social movement. And so I went um, originally to Bogota and I met with a number of leaders and I was trying to understand um, what sort of what what issues were sort of arising that were the th kind of things that were preventing um, the, the you know them from achieving their goals and so I went and so I learned a lot about the sort of again the history of of um, discrimination of racism of racialization um, and how um, the sort of from the urban perspective as well as the rural perspective and so in Colombia you have um, a large uh, there's been a large movement uh, particularly since the 90s. Um, there was a change in the constitution in 1991, and this gave um, Afro-Colombians like they were basically kind of put uh, they were put on the they were brought into the 
uh, the electorate, they were brought into um, just all of the, the conversations about space, about territory, and so there was a there was a there had been a, a sort of an ongoing sort of simultaneous fight for rural territory and then more civil rights in the cities. And so one of the issues that came up a lot was the fact that you know there's some people are saying like, look, we need to focus on on work, you know, like on getting our land and our territory. And other people were saying, like, look, we need to focus on jobs. And so this, this sort of, there's a tension, but then there's also people understand, look, we have our realms. That's what came out um, a lot in the talks. And so um, through that, I got to just start to develop an understanding about um, the struggles of people of African descent, um, as well as, as, as uh, indigenous groups in Colombia. And so again, it, it sort of, it falls within, um, this sort of uh, racial democracy myth is as much of, of Latin America does. And so a lot of conversation about like, no, um, it's not race, it's class, it's all class, without looking at the sort of intersections of race, right? And again, without, and so one of the papers, um, a paper that I published in January, um, it's in the Ethnic and Racial Studies. Um, and that, what I did was I talked about, because I, what I found interesting was that when talking about this place in the neighborhood, people would, uh, they never attribute, they never thought about the connections to race. Right? They, saw, they talked about the fact that, oh, you know, now we're kind of the hot space and we weren't before, but you know, I don't, you know. But no one sort of made a connection between the conversations that when I had with outside people, they were very quick to say, like, oh, this is a neighborhood, you know. Because I asked them, how do you think that this neighborhood differs from other neighborhoods? Right? So one is one of which I compare is um, Boca Grande, which is more of like, we call it Miami. Like it looks like Miami, it's on the beach, it has it's a very different population. Um, and people will say like, oh, first of all, this is blacker. You know, like it's poor, it's, you know, um, it's a lot more dangerous and they have all of these sort of, but people within the neighborhood, at times they sort of associate the neighborhood with having this history of being, um, of Afro-descendant, you know, being Afro-descendant, and then at times it's a rejection of it. And so what's interesting is that again, in a day-to-day -day life, you hear people talk and refer to race all the time. All the time, especially when it comes to partnership in so many different ways. But then when you sort of move into the space of development, everyone's like, oh, no, 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 it's class. It was like, you know, and so one of the things that's interesting in terms of looking at the older, um, the older conversations about the development of the nation is how much like progress was very much associated with race, right? And so unlike, but you know, so a lot of places in, in Latin America um, went through periods where basically they tried to bring in a lot of European, um, I tried to bring in a lot of European immigrants, right? And so certain countries were far more successful um, so you have Argentina, you have Chile, you have places like that, and so they were far more successful sort of attracting one with Argentina that they brought in a lot of Nazi sympathizers. And so, you know, they have a history of that as well. And so, um, but it just wouldn't take in, 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 the, in sort of the coast of Colombia the same way. And so what happens in certain spaces is, is people start talking about, you know, oh, well, it's a racial democracy, and it's that we're just so mixed. So now let's try and play up our mixedness. We clearly can't pull off the white thing, because nobody's buying it, so like let's now play off like, well, look how sexy and mixed we are, like you know, and this is racial democracy, and so you see these kinds of things play out. And what I'm trying to think about with the book is again understanding this this notion of progress, and how, um, and so in the next phase, what I, the last piece that I, I still I never got to do, but I want to do, is doing more of the visual work that looks at sort of tourism, because what I noticed there too was sort of the very subtle and not so subtle ways that marketing that the, the sort of like the city was sort of using um, these spaces to kind of rebrand, right? So on the one hand, you'll see things that are like sort of um, very sexualized. Um, and so again, like if you look at sort of the, some of the, in, the um, right, so some of the images that get used, that I use for the interviews, these are the, the you know, ask people what they thought about this, things like that. And, and so again, it's sort of play on the, the hypersexualization of, of black women comes up a lot. And sort of again, it's being a thing to attract because you have a lot of now, you have a lot of people coming for, um, for sex tourism. Um, and so, I mean, they've been coming for a long time, but again, now, it, as, because Colombia is now considered a lot more safe to people since the sort of the, the end of the conflict, um, it's attracted a lot more foreigners than, than before. So a lot of times, the, the tourism in Cartagena before was essentially fueled um, in, by people coming from within the country. And so now what you see is like the, a lot of the city and the state and the, trying to attract foreign investors. So attracting foreign investors um, and getting people to say like, no, look, you know, like we're, so what you'll see, for example, there's a, there's a person that I know, a white woman, 
um, who ends up in the newspaper, right? And she's like on a bike. And it's like, look, we, you know, like, and she's very, very, very white. And she's foreign. And so it's sort of like, look, it's safe enough for her to be here. Like, you know, like, come over, like she's here. And at the same time, you'll see like, oh, don't you want to come and play and, you know, like magical realism and play on all of these things that are very sexualized in a different way. So you see all of these things kind of at work, um, but often in a very unspoken way, all right? And so mm -hmm. people often feel very uncomfortable when I go and I'm like, you won't talk about race every two seconds. <laughs> and then you don't talk about race. Um, and so I'm trying to, you know, en engage with people about about the ways that race, uh, race, class, gender, sexuality, all of these things end up playing out. And again, even thinking about um, sort of people's take, one of the things that the neighborhood, the neighbors do as well is that the residents, that, is that they sort of compare like themselves to the, um, the backpackers, right? And again, you get a lot of these moral boundaries put up because a lot of the, a lot of the backpackers are generally white from Argentina and Chile. Um, and they come and they've now basically said, so do you see a, a major, um, fight for um, for space, like even in the plaza, because like essentially you got you have people out there juggling and like selling all the things, and so and again like this picture, this picture is a is a perfect example of what's happening. So this was always like a corner, um, and this is a very long term resident here, and uh, and here behind them are sort of our our. Uh, people from from abroad, and so everyone's come. And if you actually look up the neighborhood, it's sort of people telling like, "Oh, come to Etzimani. It's where you can kind of also do whatever you want to do. It's sort of a free for all too." And that's again ends up being very racial. That people think that there are no boundaries. That people think that there's no morality in this space, so that they can come and they can do whatever they want. And a lot of Europeans, in particular, come um, and and sort of take up. So and and it gets it's very frustrating to the residents. Um, so for example, you have people openly um, uh, snorting cocaine in the plaza. And they, they start telling me, like, you know, in front of our children, like, why do they think they don't do that at home? Why do they think they can do it here? And a friend of mine was talking to um, someone from Germany um, who got in trouble, who was telling the story about how he got in trouble. And she was like, you wouldn't, you know, she was like, you wouldn't do that at home. You know, like, why do you think that you can come here? And that, again, this idea that people do whatever they want to do, it's a free form. And again, it's also often very racialized. Um, and so you have a lot of, again, like, people are like, oh, it's just a cool space and the residents. And it was super different than when I got there. When I got there in 2011, I was uh, I was there with a British woman. We were both we were in a, a Spanish language school that was in the neighborhood. That's how I was like, all right, let's hang out. And we were the sort of we were the rarity. And then it's like you know because it was a, it was very local. And I was like, oh, like you know, it basically as you know, you wouldn't really find that many people um, who were from abroad just kind of hanging out there. I came back the next summer and I was like, whoa, explosion. Like it just had popped off. Like it got real interesting to everybody really fast. And um, and then there was an NGO already working on anti gentrification work there. A year later, there was an art center. There were all these things to sort of identify it. And again, this graffiti that ends up being in this that bottom right hand picture was actually so. Any if, if you look up the neighborhood now, you'll see a lot of um, graffiti. And so this was a project that started when I was there. So this is one of the things, it was, this wasn't even finished when I was there. So I was there, I took all the pictures. I was part of um, Vertigo Graffiti. It's a group that does, um, so basically they brought people from outside to paint and to graffiti a lot of the walls around the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So now it's sort of been like almost an open art gallery, people like to call it. Um, and so that created a lot of interesting conversations too because some people were like, you know, like they, none of those people were from Cartagena. I think maybe one or two. And so basically what they did is people, you know, artists came in, they spoke for a couple of days. I mean, they maybe like met for like a day or two, tried to learn about the neighborhood, and then they were supposed to do things that reflected Cartagena or the community. And this is one of the things that they did. Um, and No Se Pega La Negra is a song by Joe Arroyo, who's supposed to be pictured there in the blue. Um, and so this is the idea, again, you know, so I asked people about this picture. and. And so it's caused a lot of interesting, some people were saying like it's good because you know like it brings more people to the neighborhood because people go now just to do tours of, the, of these graffiti, uh, this, this project. And so, so, but at the same time, the more attractive it is to outsiders, the more of a threat it actually is to the people who are long-term residents. And again, most of, most of whom are not homeowners. So they don't have this sort of flexibility to kind of be like, oh, I might sell, and you know, um, they really end up being pushed out, which is a very long attitude. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, global affairs, a lot of times, I think our methodologies can vary. Can you talk a little bit about 
um, doing participant observation and also how you sort of gained access to um, the community and how you chose your, your subjects to interview. Sure, sure. Um, so, um, you know, I won in 2011 and I met a couple of people, but nobody, you know, so there weren't a whole lot, not a whole lot, because I wasn't really living in that neighborhood yet. So in 2011, I was living um, not super far. I could walk. It was walking distance, but it was a little ways away. Um, but I was there every day. But not really hanging out. Interestingly enough, at that time, I, I was only hanging out with, with people with other expats, right? People from abroad, and like we were kicking in, you know, having a good time. And, uh, and again, I said, no, 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 I'm going to come back here and, and investigate more. But I'm just going to sit and I'm just going to be. I'm going to hang out. Um, and so I ended up living. Um, I don't. Okay, well, this is part of. I usually do put my this. Um, this is part of, uh, of, of the of plaza, and I ended up living directly, almost like on the plaza. So, um, and so in fact, that in this neighborhood, you have the big church, um, and then right beside it, in sort of a classic, uh, uh, the Spanish, the, 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 the construction of the Spanish cities often centered around plazas and, and, and churches, and, and so this is a very sort of classic structure. And I was directly next to it, which was good because basically it forced me to be in the space even when I didn't want to. Um, so sometimes, I, for example, there was one, um, I remember being in the house cooking, um, and, and this is like open kitchen, there's a lot in terms of the structures. Um, so I was in there and all of a sudden I heard this like, you know, just a lot of something going on outside. So I like stopped what I was doing, I ran outside, I was like, what are we doing? Because that's the thing, doing participant observation and you just have to be around for things. You know, you hope that like these moments happen that are like super interesting and super rich that, that are meaningful. Um, and so part of it is just being in the space. And so at this point, um, and there being a lot of these young kids were like, so basically I'm situated here, I'm here, um, the church is here, and the police station is right here. And this is all like, I mean, we live like feet away from each other, across the street basically. And so what everyone, this, all this whole model of young people were going to the, were like yelling in front of the police station, which also just happened to be in front of my house too. Um, and so I was like, you know, what are we doing? What's going on? <laughs> you know? And they were saying, Apparently, the the officers had taken one of they were skateboarders, and they were they were they were skateboarding and um and basically right outside. So right here is the Pegasus statue, and this is like a, a long like sort of a, uh, almost like promenade. And so right here, there's a statue, and there's some like nifty little you know concrete things that that skateboarders like to to sort of you know go and, and do things on stunts and stuff. And so apparently the police had picked up a young person. And again, part of it is this idea of public space and that these young people don't really represent the where Cartagena is going. Same thing with Bender, with Street Bender, which is another thing that I'm working on. Uh, and so they ended up pulling them. And what I found interesting in terms of the people who were in front of, um, were in front of the police station were also a number of sex workers. So it ended up being a group of sex workers and the young people all like, ah, and I was like, how did this happen? But then I remembered that, remember when they talked about sex workers, sex workers being in the park here and often on, on this strip here and around here. So what I think would happen is that the young people went and they were going and then the sex workers are also recognizing that there's a public space issue here too, or you know, just saying like, all right, we're down for the cause. Everybody came together and rolled out and was in front of, you know, uh, in front of the police station talking about like, you know, that wasn't fair, he wasn't doing anything. Um, so again, this is the beauty of partisan observation. You're just in the mix, you're around. Um, and part of it again is, is asking questions. I already knew one of the young men that were in, was, was in that group before because he, I used to just hang out in the plaza with the older guys who were playing chess. They used to be a big thing that people were doing. Again, it's one of the activities that people were finding difficult to do um, given the fact that the space was being sort of taken over by, by, by people who were from abroad. And so I remember this young man, so I went directly, and I was from the year before, went directly to him. And again, it's a small community, so after a while you just start to know who is who, and sort of like, you know, and then you start, and again, talking to sort of key residents um, that kind of, and then you, you sort of also recognize all the factions and the, the sort of conflicts that are going on within this group. So you have to be very wary of that too. Because sometimes this group of people, they don't talk to this group of people. And so if you've ever seen that you're too much with one group, it can be something that ends up alienating you from another group. So you always kind of got to play this like 
hey, I'm just here. I don't have any judgment. I don't care who wins this fight between you two. I just kind of want to know what's going on. But that's also a little bit difficult because people want to see that you're a person too and that you have thoughts and opinions. And so it's really just a fine line that you constantly have to sort of like play and go back and forth and say like, oh, no, no, no. And, and then a lot of times you have to listen to people talk when you may be really tired and they want to talk to you for two and a half hours. And you're like, getting bitten up by mosquitoes. I was like, oh, this is killing me. But it was, it ended up being a lot of richness in the conversation. I just had to sift through a lot of the, um, there was a lot of gender things too, um, which is like, you know, this, this is very much about like the older men being sort of like, you don't know anything, little girl. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. And I was like, oh, you have to kind of like play into that on some level, but then kind of combat some of the more ridiculous things too. Like people want during the carnival, the Bonnie Carnival and the neighborhood celebrations, they wanted me to dress up like a, as a leper, and I was like, I'm not doing that. Um, and so you have to really like create those boundaries, um, particularly as women um, uh, in these spaces, because people will try and like, it's, it's not easy too, because again, this is where you live. It's your neighborhood, you have friends, you have relationships with people, and so it can get very murky, but, but it is something that you also have to, you know, the more you're, and it's funny too, because what ends up happening is again, people know you before you know them. So you end up, people want to talk to you, right? Um, because they're like, oh, like, especially if it's about something that's very near and dear to their hearts, right? So I, they know that I'm there to talk about this placement, so they want to tell me their stories too, right? And um, so then, you know, one person, you get this sort of snowball effect. One person introduces you to somebody else, and, you know, you know uh, introduces you to someone else. Um, and so you kind of oft often go through that as well. You're just kind of around, and then people say, like, I, I meet people, they're like, oh, yeah, you're the one doing the work, you know? You know, people like identify you all different. They're like, yeah, you're the Puerto Rican, and you're the, you know, you're this, that, and the other. And so they know you before you even come to the scene in small spaces. Anything even just about this, this trajectory is how I ended up there, or. And in terms of what everyone's trying to do here, because I'm not, you know, that's the other thing. I'm not really sure what the, what everyone's sort of their goals are. I think Rick mentioned it, you know, talking about development and this being sort of a movement that people are. But in, uh, sort of anyone here in doing work in Latin America or interested in working in Latin America? Okay, you're saying that there's not a whole lot of, um, sort of like a, people interested in this in the region. But there are a lot of parallels. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So did you feel as though sometimes people would put on a show just for your benefit? Mm -hmm because they knew the kind of work that you were doing and right. they knew that they kind of sort of needed to pull you on their side. So did you, did you feel as though they were putting on a show for you and how would you recognize that as opposed hmm. to? You know, it's interesting, that's a, good, that's a good question because I think part of, you know, part of doing work, particularly as a sociologist, is sort of saying that I'm ne not necessarily interested in this sort of the veracity, the, you know, the truthful like, nature of people's statements versus what they're presenting, right? And so part of it is saying like you document, um, you take your field notes, you go in, you know, you, I take all of the interviews and took field notes and had them transcribed. Um, but the field notes end up being interesting, and you sort of, but also the transcriptions, because you can see sometimes shifts in conversations. So for example, um, what would happen often when I would, particularly when I would be with people who are um, either European or European descent, um, they would start the conversation out in a way that they would give me the spiel. Right, so they would give me the, this neighborhood's so cool, so authentic, like, you know, I love it here, everyone's so nice. Um, they would give me that, because I, and then what I noticed then as like, as the conversation went on, it was almost as if they read me as local. So I, I phenotypically look similar to the people in the neighborhood. Um, so they kind of read me as like local, so they would give me the local spiel. It's great. Then somewhere in the conversation, you know, so for example, I was interviewing somebody who I already knew that he didn't rent to local people because of a, of a personal connection. I already knew the deal. So again, he loves the, you know, loves this this uh, community so much. They're so great. And I said, so how do you find your tenants? He was like, oh, you know, one person tells another person. I said, so do you rent to local people? He's like, oh, no, no, no. Of course not. <laughs> um, he's like, no, no, no. Like, you know, the, the, the foreigners, he's like, I rent to, you know, foreigners. They're more respectful of the properties. You know, but he said, again, foreigners, Foreigners meaning Europeans, white people. So he was, he was like, you know, Italians, French, you know, the, like those people, like they're respectful of the properties. Um, and so again, if I went just by his initial statements, I would have gotten something really different. I was like, oh no, he's like, the neighborhood is great, it's wonderful. 
But then it wasn't until sort of a little bit of that dissection and sort of like probing that you end up getting something else, which is sometimes why you have to like talk to people long enough and let them reveal themselves, you know, because if you just kind of just hit them that, you get that superficial level of conversation and then a little more digging, you're like, oh, there it is. <laughs> Um, and that came up a lot. Again, some people were just didn't didn't mind. Like Paul, who I um, talked about here, who, who was again on something in the, in the neighborhood, he had no problem talking about. No, actually, correction. No, initially he said some of the same things. Authentic, you know, or or no, it's it's cool. It's on some level, he was a little bit more standoffish about it. But he started with the spiel too, and then it was sort of like I said. So how do you find? Do you find it difficult to to find uh, people who work to work for you? He's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, these people here are lazy. They just want to sit around and talk, I'll talk all day and, and the things he said. But again, if I went on sort of like the initial conversation about why people, he's like, yeah, it's becoming more interesting because foreigners are coming. And this idea that foreigners are the improvement. Again, it's so it's, it's while this is, this is a Latin America story, it's one that's very similar to places outside, right? Because if you talk to people in Brooklyn, you have the same conversation, right? This is a revitalization where, you know, I remember when I did a community about the work in Harlem, someone told our CEO at the time, um, they were in Hamilton Heights, and this is a, you know, a, a, this is a white woman talking to a black woman who grew up in Harlem, and she says to her, like, you know, we've got this coming. She's like, it's the beginning of, it's the beginning of a community. I was like, well, what did you think existed before that? And it's like, oh, that's right, it's the Columbus Syndrome. Like, nothing existed here until you got here. Um, and so it's a very kind of um, almost settler colonial kind of perspective that like, you know, we're gonna come and you know, now there was nothing here um, before we got here. And so, you know, you see these things often, so you gotta like probe a little and knowing, sort of having the sense that most people feel that way is helpful because you start to dig and ask questions and kind of get at that thing. So on gentrification, what happens when everything is gentrified? And we're even seeing this here, right. we're seeing this in Philly, New York, I can name any up and coming city, right? right? Whatever that means. So I'm just curious, like, what happens after that? So, uh, yeah, a lot of them, and that's definitely happening here. So, again, part of the problem is that most people think that this is Cartagena. Cartagena is very, very large. And I wish I didn't have that slide. It's, uh, it's goals, it extends out, um, but nobody, nobody thinks about that as Cartagena because that is not where tourists go. So they, and uh, even people, I, I remember being there with a woman who was from the States, but um, she was, um, I don't know, she was, South, so she was Southeast Asian descent. And she, I remember her, like, we'd been there for like maybe two weeks, three weeks together. And then I was like, this is, she was like, oh, Cartagena is so small. I was like, Cartagena is actually not that, that small. You just are only staying here. Um, and so what ends up happening, though, so people don't venture out unless they have to, and that's even people within the community. And so then you have people essentially being pushed into the, the periphery, which are often like, you know, not, um, they, you know, they, have, they don't have the access to the, you know, like the resource. You still have uh, people who, um, live in, in on dirt, like there are dirt, you know, dirt uh, dirt roads and dirt, you know, like uh, metal uh, that sort of like houses with just like no floor. And so also when people think about um, the displacement, people aren't that concerned about heads and money census that much. Because they're like, look, you have, you know, like, um, you know, you've got sort of concrete, you know, buildings, you've got the old classic Spanish architecture, like y'all will be all right. Like there's real, real, real poverty outside of that. And so that's another reason why people don't want to necessarily move out to the periphery. Because then all of a sudden you have um, spaces where, again, like children have very difficult access to, you know, getting to school, um, a, a much, you know, far more limited resources because of the res resources are put into the tourist space. Um, and so, you know, like people end up, and again, so like what, what we see here is that like, you know, let's say in New York, people are moved slowly, surely just further to the outskirts of whatever the cities are. Um, they, move, they move far away from their, what they've known their whole lives to the, you know, their, their community. And so again, you get this sort of what, you know, what Mindy Fully Love calls root shock, right? You're picking people up and just, you're displacing them and you're putting them in the space. And even when people sell their homes, you, I heard a lot of stories about people, a few people that did live in the neighborhood and sold, um, sold their, their properties. Like the money just kind of goes really quickly. Um, and then they're sort of like, now they don't have community. They're out somewhere very far. And you know, the, it was a major loss. So even when you did have a house, you know, you had to decide, do I want to be like, you know, to be able to make it through 
um, financially, or do I want to have this, you know, like this community that I, that I love so much? And so it's a very difficult decision to make. And a lot of people just don't have the option. They literally just get priced out. They get, you know, again, there's a lot of what I heard too is a lot of conflict in terms of families, because a lot of times in this community you had people who were, you know, they all collectively, you know, people, you know, generation, you have multiple generations often living in, in Latin American homes. Um, and so when people, you know, marry, they move out, and then, you know, like, in, or, or they, you know, they, you know they, they stay there, and then their children, and the older, you know, and then they, people die, and so they, they keep, they stay within the, the home. And so sometimes you have a lot of siblings who left um, years ago, and they're like, they come back like, oh, wait, I heard that this neighborhood is popping off now. We need to sell. And people are like, you're not here. You know, like, of course you think that we need to sell because you just want the money, but like, we, I live here. Like, this is my community. I don't want to sell. And so apparently, you know, I've heard a lot of stories about tensions between family members because of the fact that people, you know, they're like, look, you know, they maybe would tend to be called, you know, um, house rich and income poor, um, which again was what happened a lot in Harlem too. People ended up owning brownstones because of just generations of owning the brownstones. Um, but they didn't have the income to make repairs, they didn't have the income to pay the taxes that they ended up having to, that ended up skyrocketing because of the increase in value. And so in this neighborhood, they're, they're working on the tax situation as well. Um, one of the things though, is that people often said that this is a, that, they, that the, air, the whole region, the whole area suffers from a sort of a culture of mabago, like we don't pay for, for our bills, we don't pay for our water. Um, and so the, so the city complains about that in terms of having a tax base, but then they're saying like, look, they've also, um, they get, they basically, all of your services are, you are um, priced based upon which strata, which, which sort of like economic strata your, your neighborhood is. So that means that if you were, there, so people talk a lot about this, like, oh, we used to be a strata though, like one, and now we're, up, we're three, right? So because of the gentrification, now the status, you know, the, the economic strata has, has, has risen, and so now they have to pay the bills as if they were richer, just because of everyone around them, you know. Um, is it, with whether they have you know more high income people around them or just the neighborhood itself, people are saying like, look, this is a much higher income you know neighborhood. So basically, so the, everyone's trying to figure out how they can um, work with the city and work with NGOs to say like, look, you know, can we at least have sort of like you know a tax holiday on this, or can we at least like can you at least maintain um, sort of maybe like that we're we we're considered strata one. Um, but yet, you know, newcomers get considered, are considered strata three, and people are trying to come up with solutions so that people in there can, can stay for at least for as long as they can. But you know, when you start to do gentrification work, over, you get real tired because you sort of feel like I know where this story is going, I know how this ends, um, and that's what became really evident very early on. And then, and I haven't been back since 2014. And when I left in 2014, I was like, oh, this is, I mean, it's night and day. Like 2011 to 2014 was night and day. Um, and just so many people were gone. Again, just the the, the way that the neighborhood looked, the uh, it just was was pretty. Uh, it was quite startling. And again, people just like you know everything with the bicycles all around. Like and again, like it's it's interesting to see the sort of key tourism kind of moves that that the city was making that were again very um, very reflective of sort of an interest in attracting people who were, had particular uh, interests as foreigners. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. Really great to have this. <laughs>